Hey, welcome to 2019. It's Zoe Routh, and we're kicking off this year's podcast series with the theme of Reset. Yeah, baby. Welcome to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast, your source of strategies and insights to make you a better leader. Influence, improve, inspire. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It feels like a welcome back, even though plenty of you have gone back to work already. Uh, My Australian listeners, I know that many of you are still on leave, taking the January uh, leave pass to enjoy the surf and sun and all things summer. Whereas my overseas listeners, you might still be in winter and deep in winter and your Christmas break was short and sweet. Speaking of short and sweet Christmas holidays, I was over in the United States visiting my sister who married a New Yorker and is now living in New Jersey. And we had a wonderful North American Christmas. No white Christmas, I have to say. That was a bit disappointing, but you can't have everything. It was wonderful just to be with my family. And we had a really pleasant time. You know how family Christmases can sometimes be, well, less than friendly? Well, this one was lovely. We all were filled with the joys of Christmas and had a wonderful time playing lots of board games. Boggle is my personal favorite. From there, I, we, we, I, we, Rob, Rob and I, my husband and I went to Japan as we have done for the last seven or eight years and had two wonderful weeks skiing in Japan. So we've been in winter for a month and then came back to 40 degrees Celsius weather here in Australia. 60 degree temperature variation. It's been pretty wild. So we've had a really lovely long break, and in that is has been plenty of time to think about 2019 and what it, what it should bring and what I want for it and for me. And uh, I'm also delighted to say that this is our 100th episode of the podcast. It feels like a milestone, doesn't it? Like 100 episodes. We've been going for two years, and I've learned plenty of things along the way and have enjoyed producing content for you each week in the effort to help you become a better boundless leader. And in that idea of being a boundless leader, I had two major reflections, and it's funny how how these reflections come about. And they were while I was skiing, and I remember one of them popped into my brain as I was exiting gondola and collecting my skis. And my major ref- one of my major reflections for 2019 is this. It was, I was thinking about how people with religious beliefs can take any incident and use it as evidence for their belief. Doesn't matter what the incident is, what the material object is, it's, it always proves their point about what they believe in. Whether the devil did it or it's God's hand, it's their belief can be reinforced by whatever evidence is placed before it. And I thought to myself, I was going down the disparaging route of that, saying, well, isn't that crazy that they they can't see objective truth? And then it occurred to me is that this idea that belief requires evidence and that we can turn any evidence into any material experience into evidence for a belief, I was like, well, that could be extremely empowering. (laughs) It doesn't have to be a negative thing. What if we chose beliefs that were empowering and deliberate and produce really amazing results and then decided to look for the evidence of that wherever we are? And that was amazing to me. I was like, wow, I could have these really powerful beliefs such as the universe is, is conspiring for my success and anything that happens is evidence of that belief. Isn't that wonderful? Because that would eliminate any doubt, frustration, anxiety. Because if the universe is always conspiring for my success, everything that happens is obviously for my success. Therefore, nothing is bad. It's always for the good. And that was kind of just a liberating moment for me because I had been I had been stewing on this some of these work things while I was skiing, and it was worrying me. And I'm like, why am I worrying? This is not a great way to experience the world in this middle of this beautiful place is to have all this worry and doubt. What could I do to shift this? And then brain got distracted and got onto this whole idea of belief requiring evidence and how you could turn any evidence to reinforce that belief. I'm like, wow, what if I decided to choose the belief that everything in my business is a source of excitement? And that was that. I had the best day ever after that because <laughs> like everything I focused on was like, it's just, it's just material for excitement in my practice. It's not source of worry. So that's my first reflection for the year. 
And then my second one was this, are all emotions boundless? Because I was thinking, what is boundless? What in our experience is boundless? And some things are clearly not boundless. And the things that are not boundless will lead into the content for today around reset. And that's around the physical management of self. Because I find there are some serious limitations to the human body. And so I find that it is not boundless and we have to manage it carefully. So then I thought, thought, stopped and thought, well, what is boundless? Are there things about the human experience that are boundless? Imagination is boundless. Possibility is boundless. What about emotions? And I thought, is pain a boundless emotion? Can you have boundless pain? I thought, no, you can't actually. I think pain as an emotion is a contraction. It contracts everything about you as a person. Emotional pain just has you shrinking and, and, and gathering into self and to a point there is no more place to gather. So it is finite. It is not boundless. Whereas the emotion of kindness is boundless. It's an expansive emotion. And as we expand into kindness, it can get bigger and bigger and bigger, whereas pain just diminishes until it is nothing. So I thought that was a pretty powerful insight. I'm going to play with this and probably blog and podcast on this a little bit later. But this idea of latching onto kindness as an expansive, never-ending emotion is what has helped frame my theme word for the year, which is, as you guessed, kindness. And that's going to help shape a lot of how I set up my year and the processes for reset. All right. Oh, I do need to tune into the fact that it is our 100th episode, and I do have a special gift to all listeners. Every single listener, this is not a, you know, put your name in the hat, you might win something thing. Everyone wins a prize if they want it. And the offer for all my listeners who've been with me either for a short time or a long time, uh, doesn't matter if you're listening to this episode, you have the opportunity to partake in the festival of the 100th episode by sending an email to hello at innercompass.com.au. And that's where my assistant, Crystal, will uh, get your email. And when she does, you can include in your email your postal address. And we are very delighted to send you a hard copy of my latest book, Loyalty. Hard copy, not just an ebook version, the actual thing in your hand, a actual book in your hand of loyalty. Uh, and it's my book on employee engagement and how to build um, long lasting, lifelong, enthusiastic fans in your work. <laughs> Um, I love this book. It's been a really useful little handbook. So if you want to get your hot little hands on a hot brand new copy signed by me, my assistant will mail it to you in the post, no charge to you, free gratis as a gift from us to you for listening to our podcast and helping it make it to its 100th episode. So all you have to do again is send an email to hello at innercompass.com.au and in that, put your postal address. And in the subject heading, it'd be helpful if you said podcast, so Crystal doesn't get all these random emails. Put podcast in the subject line, and we will post out in the post, in the mail, like old school style, a copy of Loyalty. Isn't that cool? All right, so that's my first act of kindness of the year to my general audience and you, the listener. Very excited. So coming to then the theme of kindness by the way, do you have a theme word for the, for the year? I totally encourage it. I've been doing it for years and years and years. It's been popularized and blogged about by some of the people I admire most, like Dr. Jason Fox. And the idea of having a focus word, a theme word for the year, it helps shape your decisions for the year. It helps steer you in the direction uh, of where you want to go. As opposed to having very delineated, specific, time-bound, action-oriented goals, a theme word helps guide the overall sense of your world and the quality of your life and the quality of your world thus changes. How did I latch on to kindness? Well, it's interesting. One of my mentors at Thought Leaders Business School was having us do an exercise where he said, think about when you were five, when you were 15, and when you were 30 or 25 if you're under 30. And he said, think about incidents where you were the best version of yourself, where you were the epitome of love, where you were being kind and generous. And he gave some examples from his own life. And I sat there in the audience, stumped. I'm thinking to myself at five, 
or thereabouts. And I couldn't remember much acts of kindness. I can remember much acts of silliness and of adventure, but kindness? No. Then I thought of myself at 15. I'm like, I was not a kind person at 15. I think I was a fairly self-indulgent, self-obsessed, narcissistic teenager. (laughs) I was like, where was the acts of kindness there? I didn't have any of the experiences he had. And then at 30, I'm like, what was I doing at 30? I was immersed in work. And so it kind of unsettled me. I'm like, I'm not sure that I have any recollections of being deeply kind. I'm like, surely, surely there must be some incidents and examples of me being kind. But none of them were forefront in my mind. And I thought, wow, what, how have I been living? Is kindness not an important thing to me? And of course it's important, but it has never been front and center. And so I thought, well, Kindness, therefore, is the theme word for the year for me. And I will navigate my world with this at the helm. It'll be my inner compass guiding me for the year. And it's interesting when you have the word kindness as your as your filter. Because then I started thinking about, how do I want to craft my year? How will kindness shape that? And the first part of kindness was kindness to myself. And I think this is the one that we often struggle with. It's easy to be kind to others. Not so easy to be kind to yourself. And so with this theme word, I decided to filter that into the idea for the quarter, which is reset. Come back to core principles, come back to basic principles of how to lead life. And with that, the overlaying flavor of kindness. So in this episode, we're going to walk, I'm going to walk you through my strategies and my resources, and there's going to be a ton of them. So heads up, the podcast notes where I'll list all the books and et cetera, will be at zoerouth.com, uh, au slash, no, sorry, zoerouth.com slash podcast slash 100. There's no dot au in there. So dot com dash podcast, sorry, slash podcast slash 100, like the number 100, 100. Okay, well, I just kind of butchered that <laughs> URL, didn't I? But <laughs> I'll repeat it later when I'm hopefully not too bamboozled. <laughs> okay, so with that, so we've got the theme for the year, which is kindness. We've got the theme for the quarter, which is reset, and we're looking at core principles. Within that, I had specific goals, and I looked at the goals I wanted to achieve, and the first one is to run a half marathon. The second one is a Uh, trip to the Himalayas, and the third is to fill my programs. Those are overarching goals for the year. So as I looked at these, I wanted to filter them through the kindness lens, and I thought about this, and I thought about why. Why these goals, and how do I incorporate or make sure that they fit in with my kindness goal or my kindness theme? And the way that I did that is I asked, why am I doing these things? So looking at the half marathon, Uh, goal. And I've run half marathons before. My last one was 2015, so a few years ago now. And previously, to do things like marathons and half marathons, the the reason why I wanted to do that was basically to prove something to myself. It was set a goal, work hard, achieve it. These are not achievement goals for me anymore. So to run a half marathon is not is not like the first time I did it. I know I can do it. I know what the work entails to get there. It's not even about that. It's not even for bragging rights, though. Sure, if you run a marathon, hell, brag about it. I did. <laughs> I've run six, I've trained for seven. I always add that caveat because the training is just as is harder often than the actual race. In any case, it's not about that. So how kindness filters through my half marathon goal is this. I want this to be a celebration of health and living. Uh, two years ago, I had a, a major health setback with adrenal fatigue and I was dragging myself through the days and I've worked really hard to come back from that and to heal my adrenals and and to feel really full of energy again. So the half marathon is about celebrating that. It's about running for the joy of running. And I started running again last year and it's been so wonderful. Each run has been delightful to be outside and just a celebration of being alive and healthy. And as you know, I had cancer in 2005, which seems long ago and also near, (laughs) near to not that long ago. Um, So the half marathon for me is about celebration of health and living. That's the kindness overlay. The trip to the Himalayas, which we're aiming to do in November, is a hiking trip. And the reason to do that is not to say, 
I'm going to Himalayas, though for sure it'll give me bragging photos. <laughs> totally anticipate glorious scenery. It's more about honoring my adventurous spirit and being kind to myself and giving myself permission to do things that that fuel me, that light me up, that that make me tingle with excitement when I think about what's coming up. And that trip is about that. It's a kindness to myself to uh, give myself permission to do things that that really feed who I am as a human being. The third goal to fill my programs. This is an interesting one. I had to sit and pause with this. I'm like, why am I actually choosing that as a goal? Because the high achiever in me has always been about max it out, go hard, go home, win the prize, be the type A personality. And that doesn't feel that kind to me anymore because there's a lot that sucks that is sacrificed on the altar of those kinds of achievements. And so what I wanted to do instead was to look at fill my programs from a kindness lens. What is the kindness thing I can bring to this idea of filling my programs? And as I was contemplating this, because I was really cautious that I wouldn't just like pretend to put a kindness overlay on this, (laughs) then just do it anyway, my high achieving self takes over. I came across an article about James Arthur Ray. Now, you may recall, uh, this was some time ago, 10 years ago now, James Arthur Ray was one of the superstars from the breakthrough movie, The Secret, when the law of attraction stuff really hit mainstream when Oprah promoted it. And he was like the megastar. He was like this super attractive teacher of the law of attraction. And um, he was showcased twice on Oprah and his career went gangbusters after that. Just went absolutely nuts. So from 2005, which is when the law of attraction, the secret really kind of hit, hit its straps, James Arthur Way's career took off and he was basically becoming, aiming to become the Tony Robbins of personal development in that he was focused on business success, spiritual success, and um, business success, business, what is this? business, spiritual and health, I think. So he was trying to tie all those three things together and he was running programs based on each of those. So he had a money program, he had a belief program, um, he had like a pyramid of, of programs and he was doing all the typical things that you do when you are a high profile celebrity speaker to build your programs into a mega industry. And I'm familiar with this because I've been immersed in that industry myself for 20 years, and I've learned from some people who who model the kinds of things that James does. Mm. Just having a sip of my hot chocolate, which is pretty gross, actually. <laughs> I put some protein powder in there, and it's all lumpy. Ew. Well, I won't do that again. Okay. James Arthur Ray. Anyway, he was a big superstar secret. And then uh, 10 years ago, in 2009, he was leading this retreat, a five-day retreat called Spiritual Warrior. And in it, in this retreat, he was running a sweat lodge. Now, a sweat lodge that he apparently, the ideas and the structure of it, he took from the Lakota Indians. And he wasn't authorized or trained or endorsed as a sweat lodge facilitator. He just, I think he he partook in it and won himself. And then he decided he was going to include that in his program. So he's running this sweat lodge thing with 60 participants in this big structure uh, in Phoenix. And what happened is a bunch of people collapsed and three participants died, uh, died in that sweat lodge experience. It was horrific. And about 18 more were, went to hospital with extreme burns and um, and poisoning, and um, I think they thought it was poisoning, but basically heat injuries. And what happened is in that incident, they called one of one of the people who runs the um, the structure or the or the facility called nine one one. They got some people out there. They got people out. Where was James? Well, James came out first out of the sweat lodge, got hosed down, and stood around watching, did nothing, went back to his own his own accommodation, had a shower, called his lawyer, who basically said, look, you're being investigated. The cops knocked on his door and said, hey, this is now a homicide investigation. And he's like, what are you talking about? He's like, your participants, three of them are dead. And so he called his lawyer and his lawyer said, you need criminal representation. You need to get out of there. So he left 
He left the scene. He left, he left the remaining participants, 40 odd of them, to their own devices, to look after each other, to sit at the, at the retreat property and wonder what the hell happened. He left the scene. And as a leader, I am horrified by this. You know, as a facilitator, I'm horrified by this. As an experienced outdoor experiential educator person who knows that you have duty of care to your participants, I'm horrified by this, um, that he fled the scene. Well, how the story ends is those people died. Um, Nobody saw James again at at the retreat center anyway. He, the court, the thing went to trial and he was uh, accused, accused, he was found guilty of negligent homicide and he spent two years in prison and he came out in 2013. So the incident happened in 2009. By 2013, he was, had been in prison and out again after two years and he was reestablishing his business. He is reestablishing his business. I sat with this story. I spent a lot of time actually on this weekend Googling all the stories and history of this because I found it extremely traumatizing to read about this from a number of different reasons. Um, Having been a big advocate and proponent and fan of The Secret myself back in 2005 when I was going through cancer, the idea of law of attraction, the way that you can make sense of your own destiny by channeling your thoughts was really empowering thought for me as I was going through cancer. I'm like, okay, I can take control of this experience. I can have it turn out to my advantage, to something that's good for me. I don't have to live in stress with this. That's how I adopted and embraced the law of attraction. And I looked up to all the teachers in the secret as people who were obviously doing this clearly well. And then a couple of years later to have James Arthur Ray do this to, is just deflating when one of your models falls over themselves and kills people at, at, a, at an experience is, is just horrible. And as an outdoor educator, that's like your worst nightmare, right? Is to have somebody die on your watch. But you don't leave the scene. You stay, you work it through, you look after people, you, you think of all the other participants there. So it was kind of like a crushing realization about what can happen to people if we don't pay attention to what we're doing, if we don't lead with love. And this was one of the thoughts that I came, I awoke with one of these mornings thinking about James Arthur Ray is that he was not leading with love. I'm not sure what he was leading with. He wasn't really leading. Maybe it was hubris, maybe it was ego. And in the document, documentary, 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 there you go, they They made a documentary about James Arthur Ray, and I went and watched that too, called Enlighten Us, and it's about the story of his rise and fall. And they had some uh, footage of him, interviews of him before all this incident. They had lots of uh, interviews with people, survivors of the incident. They didn't interview any of the families of the people who died. Um, They interviewed James himself before and after and his reframing of it. And one of the things he said, like one of the one of the closing questions was, um, thinking about the incident now, what do you think? And he said, it had to happen. It was important for that to happen for me to grow and evolve as a human being, which c- kind of landed like in thunder in my ears. I'm like, what? Three people died on your watch and you're saying it had to happen because it was important for you to grow as a human being. This is the most biggest bastardization of rationalizing I've ever heard in my life. And there's plenty of commentary about him as a narcissist and self-obsessed and delusional and twisting all of those experiences to serve his own story. And I feel that perhaps James Arthur Ray is a very gifted orator, he's very charismatic, and that's how he persuaded a lot of people to do what he wanted them to do in the sweat lodge, you know, because people were not comfortable. They were not, there was people collapsing around them and yet they stayed because he said people needed to stay. They could leave at any time, but you couldn't really. When you're under the guidance of somebody as charismatic as that, it is very difficult to stand up and say, no, I'm leaving. And it's one of the dangers of authority. One of the dangers of charismatic leaders is that you can be drawn into experiences that, you know, somewhere in part of you are, are so negative. So this is all the background of what's boiling at the fore of my question about how do I want to film, why do I want to film my programs? Because I think one of the things that drove James Arthur Ray was ego, was hubris. He even talks about that in the in the in the um, documentary, which I can't believe he's so stupid to think that this is a vindication of him. And he even lists on his on his current website that he's 
been they've done this documentary on him because I find it the most one of the most damning things uh, out there on him, and he's sort of celebrating it as a I don't know as a redemption story. Which, by the way, his new book coming out is called Redemption. James Arthur Ray was driven by ego, by hubris, and wanting to be the big guns. He wanted to be as big as Tony Robbins. He wanted to be the first billion dollar. Uh, entrepreneur in self-help, and he was driven by targets. He was driven by that, and he had this narrative that I'm just here to help people. You don't, you don't do what he did at that retreat if you just want to help people. I think he really bought into his own story, and I think he didn't. He did all the trappings of experiences without really the grounded knowledge. He kind of just stole them from different places. He did trust falls. He did ropes courses. Uh, he did something called the Samurai Game, which I looked up as a, you need to be authorized for that. He's not endorsed or accredited in that. Uh, and then he did the Sweat Lodge, which is a part of a really important part of Lakota, um, Lakota Indian heritage and one of their cultural practices. And you should never steal culturally appropriate an activity because it sounds good. It's just wrong, wrong, wrong. So I thought about all this and thinking about my goal for filling my programs. And I thought, I don't, what I don't want is to have a James Arthur Ray down the rabbit hole of hubris and ego and goal-driven experiences. And that's the other thing. One of the other, okay, one more thing, and then I'm going to stop ranting about James Arthur Ray. In the documentary, they talk about this is before the the major incident. He was talking about the structure of his business and how it just became a massive machine that he had to earn $6 million a year just to break even because all of his production values were so high. And he was working seven days a week, many, many hours a day. I'm like, this doesn't sound like law of attraction to me. This sounds like good old hard elbow grease where you caught on the hamster wheel of trying to drive your own success train and not really savoring it. So I didn't want any of that. What I want in my programs is for me to enjoy them and to give people an amazing experience that is valuable to them. So that is my goal in filling my programs is to get the right people in the programs who are ready for the kind of development that I offer and that I show up in complete service to them so that they get the maximum value that they need to in order to be the person and leader that they want to be. Very different feeling to me than previous goals of filling programs, where it can be, it can def- slide down that slippery J A R road. Okay, fin- I promise, I'm finished with him. <laughs> okay, so those are my three goals half marathon, go to the Himalayas, and fill my programs overlaid with the lens of kindness. Kindness. Mm-hmm. Yep. So let's get into the nitty gritty. How are we going to do this? Or how am I going to do this? And I'll share some of my strategies and feel free to cherry pick what what works for you. That's my intention in sharing this is that some of these things will resonate and you'll want to pick up and do them too. The first nitty gritty strategy is around boundaries. This is nothing new. This is something I've been teaching for 20 years is that we need to be more mindful of the rules that we have about how we engage with ourselves, with our world, with other people. And the thing about boundaries, and I apply this specifically to work boundaries, is that for me, work is like an exercise addict. It's so addictive. I can do it over and over and over and on and on and on. And like an exercise addict, too much can become a negative thing. You can get, you can fry yourself as an exercise addict, like you can fry yourself as a work addict. So I've had to put some boundaries in place for myself. And this, some of these are uh, no work on weekends. And people are like, duh, isn't that just common sense? And you'd be surprised how many people work on weekends. So for me, no client work on weekends. So I'm not taking any retreats over weekends. I'm not doing anything like that. I have two programs that are booked over weekends. Those are over the Lara Pinta. And that's it for the year. And I booked them well last year, well ahead of time last year. So no work, no work on weekends. And I want to put containers around my work so that I have a clear starting time and a clear finishing time so it doesn't leak, leak at the edges. I want some clear start and finish times around that. Okay, so boundaries is the first thing. Second thing, routines. I've spoken about routines a lot. Routines need to be rituals. So we take them so seriously and honor them so much that they are rituals. They are a sense of sacredness to them. 
And I spoke um, not so long ago in an earlier podcast about some of the routines I've been working on. My One of them is my morning routine. And I have yet to nail this completely. I'm still trying to get this sorted, but I have got some major anchoring points with this that are working. And basically the ones that I want to put in place that hasn't been fully fledged yet is journaling. I don't always journal in the morning. I do meditation, yes. And then I go to the gym and do my a run or a workout. And I've got a tracker for all of that. Um, so I do track statistics on my meditation. Statistics on meditation, that sounds very non-spiritual, doesn't it? <laughs> what I mean is that I do self-quantification methods as I meditate and I check my heart rate and my heart rate variability, which I've spoken about before. And that gives me evidence of the health of my physical well-being, my my nervous system health. And that's really important to me considering I went through adrenal fatigue. So meditation, uh, run and a workout, run or a workout, I should say. Okay. The other aspect coming back to that is journaling. And now there's two types of journaling that I want to, sorry, three types of journaling that I'm going to include in the morning. The first one is to centering back to my theme word of kindness. And that's to ask the question, how did I show kindness today or yesterday, because if it's in the morning, how did I show kindness? How was I kind to myself? How was I kind to others? So a little bit of a reflection around kindness. Another piece, which I got from somebody else, I wish I could remember where I read this. They had this wonderful habit of journaling, of collecting moments. So they'd reflect on their day and just pick out a moment that was special for that day. And at the end of the year, they had 365 moments they could go back and reflect on. And with these little traces of moments, they could really savor a year well lived. And I really loved that. Having written the book Moments, I thought that's a pretty good one. So I'm going to have a one moment per day collection. And it's like a bullet journal style of journaling where you just one day, one dot point, one moment there you go. It's not onerous. It only takes a moment. Haha. <laughs> and you can, it's an accumulation phase. And I'm looking forward to, I'm getting, um, uh, what's his name? James Clear, another James. I was about to say James Arthur Ray, because I've said his name so many times in this podcast. James Clear, his book, he, Atomic Habits, he's now got a companion journal, uh, which is about helping to embed some of these habits and his practices. So I've ordered that. It's on its way. I'm going to use the that journal to record my one moments per day in there. Very excited by that. The third type of journaling is my decision journal. So I started doing this already. So I started recording the issues that were troubling me as questions. And I thought, what are the questions that I have and what are the decisions I need to make? And then stewing on it, making a decision and recording the decision and reflecting on that. So as I go through my decision journal, I can look back and say, what was bothering me? What decision did I make? How did I make that decision? And what has been the outcome? And I got this idea from the book, The Decision Checklist by Sam Kyle. Really good book. So by the way, I've started listing off all these different resources. They're all going to be listed at the show notes, zoeyrouth.com slash podcast slash 100, like the numbers 100. All right, so we've got boundaries, we've got routines. Number three, number three is nutrition, big one. So if we're coming back to reset on nutrition, because I've found over the last two years, I've sort of wavered all over the place with nutrition, and I really want to get back to some core boundaries and core practices around nutrition. So one of the things I'm doing is experimenting around fasting. I'm doing 16 and 8 fasting protocol, which means that you fast for 16 hours and eat within an eight-hour window. In practical terms, this means finishing dinner. Uh, I usually finish dinner around 7 and not eating again until 11 or 12. And that's essentially a 16-hour fasting window with an eight-hour eating window, if you like. So I skip breakfast, which sounds devastating after we've had all this stuff pumped into you. Breakfast, most important meal of the day. You need to have a meal. And I found, no, actually, I don't need to have breakfast and that I feel quite good not eating breakfast. And my insulin sensitivity has improved. I don't get big crashes anymore. I don't get the, I don't get hangry anymore, which is pretty big. For those of you who've ever been around me when I've been hangry, it's not good. That's gone with this 16-8 fasting protocol. 
The other thing I'm doing with nutrition is carb cycling. What that means is that uh, I will eat low carb uh, throughout the week and then have a refeed on Saturday, which is the day of my long run. So I'm eating low carbs for most of the week and then I bump up the carb consumption on Saturdays after my long run, which is what I need for training for the half marathon. Um, I'm also going to include a weekly 24-hour fast. Well, this stage is weekly. We'll see how we go. And when I do that is, so I'll do a refeed on Saturday, which means eating lots of carbs and um, enjoying food that I haven't necessarily had for the week. And then Saturday night after dinner, I fast for 24 hours. And so I don't eat anything from after Saturday dinner until Sunday dinner. So Sunday is a rest day. And I chill out, drink lots of fluids, lots of herbal teas, lots of lemon water, and chill out. So there's no huge caloric requirement or physical requirement for me on that day. And I'm also intending to do an infrared sauna uh, just down the road at this new center that has infrared sauna stuff and cryotherapy and all sorts of um, fun stuff. Never done infrared sauna before. So I'm literally looking forward to that. It's a really good detox process. So Sunday is rest and detox and fasting. Okay. So that's my fasting protocol. In terms of nutrition, I'm basically sticking to a pescatarian. That's a fish eating vegetarian, slow carb uh, protocol. And slow carb is from Tim Ferriss's book, The Four Hour Body, where he he eliminates most carbs except for slow carbs, which are things like lentils and legumes. And that lines up with my nutritionist's recommendation anyway. So slow carb for the week, refeed on Saturday. Bonza. <laughs> the other resource I'm using for a lot of the tips and tricks that you might want to get your hands on is called the Biohackers Handbook. This is a massive tome. I have the ebook and they just released it in print and it's just huge. And it's full of really cool biohacks, um, from mental fit, fitness to physical fitness to nutrition to exercise. A lot of great protocols in that. So I'll put a link to that for you as well. Okay. Along with all this nutrition and um, other routines, the I should mention the self-quantification bits that I'm doing. I mentioned heart rate and heart rate variability. I'm also going to track my body fat. And I'm trying to get in to get a DEXA scan, which is a full body, uh, body composition scan looks at your bone density and it looks at your lean muscle tissue, your hydration, a bunch of stuff. And I have the, I have like at home scales that do that, but I want the full scan to make sure like to be more accurate with it. So I'm going to line that up and test that maybe twice this year. So that's going to happen. My aura ring, which tracks sleep quality and, and so on is showing up on Tuesday. I'm so excited. And that's to track sleep because sleep is my number four uh, protocol um, for manage, for managing my reset. I've spoken about sleep before and on the podcast and it's so important and I've yet to really nail this. So nailing the sleep routine is going to be critically important. The order rings going to track the results of that. So my end of day routine to help with sleep is going to be 8 30 PM wind down, which means close computer, laptop, whatever screens and start the end of day routine. And that's going to consist of cold shower. Why a cold shower, do you say? I thought that too. But apparently it helps with sleep. It also helps with toning the vagus nerve, which is helping with the uh, nervous system health. And it helps get you ready for, for sleep. So you have a cold shower and you get into your pajamas if you wear pajamas. And it lowers your body temperature, getting ready for sleep. Uh, go through my beauty routine, which is applying moisturizers and put essential oils on the bottom of my feet. I use doTERRA essential oils. They're very high quality. And I use the lavender peace blend to put on the bottom of my feet. And you can just feel it soaking in. Um, bottoms of your feet are very um, absorbent, by the way. Like I didn't know this until I tried it. I put some lavender oil on there and it's like, and you can feel it relaxing and activating really quickly in your system. So essential oils are part of that. Meditation. That's the piece I haven't been able to incorporate for my end of day routine. So I'm going to start small, five to 10 minutes, and incorporate that. So that means no more reading the iPad, which has been my downfall. I've been stuck with that forever. And so I have to take do some radical intervention on myself and move the iPad. Actually, I said I was going to do this. I haven't done it yet. 
I know, right? Don't even honor promises to myself. iPad is getting charged in another room. It does not come to bed. It is not part of my end of day routine. It is shut down at 8.30. Uh Aha. So the question I have for myself is, well, when do I do my fiction reading? Because that's usually when I like to read. It's right before bed. And it doesn't necessarily always help for sleeping because a lot of the books I read sometimes are not that... Uh, sleep oriented. I'm reading a series right now on Genghis Khan, and there's a lot of bludgeoning and uh, raping and pillaging in this in this novel or these series of novels, I should say. And it doesn't exactly set you up for a peaceful sleep. So iPad relocated. Reading's not going to happen then. It's going to happen. It can happen any time between up to eight thirty. So I suspect my Netflix habit is going to go by the by. Finish dinner with Rob, and eat dinner on the deck, enjoy the evening, maybe do a little bit of reading before I kick off the evening routine. So we'll see how we go with that. We're heading into number five out of the nitty gritty tips for reset. And that's the support crew. Who's on your support crew? I look to Janine Garner's book, It's Who You Know, for tips on that. It's a really good book. It's a very practical handbook where you can evaluate your network and see who you've got around you that's supporting you in your success. She has four main characters, characters' roles that you can get people to fill. There's the butt kicker, somebody who can make sure that you're really following through. So I actually probably need a butt kicker for some of these habits, right? (laughs) I think I need to think about that a little bit more clearly. Who Who can I be more accountable to? Because all of you podcast listeners, nobody has reached out to me and said, have you done it? So not that you, I actually asked you to do that. So you don't, you guys don't work as accountability partners. <laughs> I need somebody who's going to nail me on this one. Okay, butt kicker. For my butt kicker, at the moment I have, I'm hiring my personal trainer back. So I've changed back to my old gym, getting my old personal trainer back and incorporating that into my accountability structure. My promoter, I'm going to be reaching out and building a board of advisors to help me enact kindness in my business and keep myself sane. A teacher... I haven't really settled on teacher for the year, so that's sort of to be decided. And pit crew, pit crew and making sure that you are actually rebooting properly. And I'll be talking to my nutritionist and my massage therapist about playing those roles. So there you have it. That's my reset strategies. Those are my uh, tips and tricks and hacks and resources for you. All will be up on the show notes. They are in order. One, boundaries. Two, routines or rituals. Three, nutrition. Uh Four is sleep, five is team support, and there's a bonus one, (laughs) number six, and that's crafting a physical environment that's supportive. And you you might might have noticed there's a big sort of ta-da or to-do about Marie Kondo's um, strategies, I guess, strategies or system for decluttering. And I think I read Marie Kondo a year or so ago, and I thought she was great, and I've implemented some of her strategies already. And she has a very specific process for decluttering. And the objective is to bring joy. Everything in your, in your world brings you joy is the caveat for decluttering. And she's got a very practical way of doing that. If you combine that with um, Ingrid Fettel Lee's book, Joyful, which looks at the things in your environment that can spark joy, such as color and texture and different shapes and those types of things, you have a wham-bam Uh, you beauty combination for crafting an environment that is supportive and wonderful. So I'll be slowly implementing those throughout the year as well. Okay. Phew. Kindness. How was I kind today? Well, I was kind kind to myself today. I had a fabulous workout, had a nice sleep. Um, I actually did have a good night's sleep last night. And I reached out to some of my clients and sent them a nice message and just reminding myself to be kind to myself and to lead with love. Happy 2019. I'm glad you're here. I hope you have a brilliant start to the year. Remember, if you want a free copy of Loyalty, the hard copy kind, send an email to hello at intercompass.com.au with your postal address and with podcast in the subject line. And we will post out a copy of Loyalty to you. All right, folks, thanks for listening. Lead well, live well.